The transfer portal. While December 5th is your hard date, it's like it's already opening up as guys enter it, such as Seth Jones. This is Locked On Baylor. You are Locked On Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Baylor. I'm Drake Toll from Sports Illustrated's Inside the Bears. That's John Garcia, Jr., the Director of Recruiting at Sports Illustrated. Thank you for making Locked On Baylor your first listen every single day. And thank you to LinkedIn Talent Solutions for sponsoring today's show. John, the, the transfer portal, we have mentioned all offseason how prevalent it's become in college football. But surprise to me, it's kind of become this new trend that players are no longer waiting for the end of the season. They're six weeks into the year, their coach leaves or they don't like where they are. And a la Seth Jones at Baylor, these guys hit the road. Does that shock you at all? Like I kind of feel a little taken aback by the popularity of this now. When the coach leaves, no, right? I mean, I think that is something that is almost expected to a certain degree. So, you know, for those, you know, Wisconsin players, Nebraska players, Colorado players, totally understandable, right? You you have no idea what your new boss will, will look like or, or coach like, so you want to get out ahead of the transfer portal curve. That I understand. But the flip side of it, and we're seeing this at Notre Dame, Baylor, as you mentioned, Auburn yeah. as well, where there, there hasn't been a coaching change, uh, and in Auburn's case yet, I think is the caveat there. Yeah. We're seeing kids – kind of take it upon themselves to not only hit the portal, but announce it, go public with it. So other schools know you are on the board. Um, a lot of those have come with red shirts attached to those requests. So basically, Hey coach, I played in a few games. I want to maintain this red shirt because I played in four or less. So I yeah. have an intention to sit out, um, stay in school and, and go from there. I just saw one today with Josh Braun, the offensive lineman at Florida. He's going to sit out the rest of the year. Uh, finish up his degree or wherever he is academically and then hit the portal uh, at that time. So yeah, this is a different type of deal because it's not just entering the portal, it's announcing your intentions to do so. So while there's still some muddy water in the communication department, are you actually in the portal? When, when all those rules can be set in motion, sure. But for for anything minimally, these coaches elsewhere that are always looking into this thing, yeah. now they know, hey, at least we know, look, Logan Brown, big offensive lineman in Wisconsin, he's going to hit the portal here uh, pretty soon, even if he's not in there officially just yet. So it's a bit of a heads-up mentality. And, and like we saw with the uh, Christian McCaffrey, uh, I believe Leonard Fournette opt-outs years ago mm. uh, during bowl season, when one prominent player does it, it kind of perks everyone's ears up. Like, hey, maybe I can do something like that in this player empowerment era. So it's it's something that, yeah, it's, it's just going to be a 12-month conversation, although next year we'll have more specific windows when some of these actions can actually go down. If you are Dave Aranda or any Division One college football coach in an instance like this, what then becomes the strategy for a guy out of Wisconsin or Colorado or Florida who ent enters the portal, quote, quote unquote, for the ones listening, uh, in in October? H how do you attack that and get on the front of that when, hey, I may be interested in this guy, but I I'm in the middle of my football season and technically this guy's not really in the portal. It just feels so complex. Yeah, it is. It is. You know, and, and I think these coaches that are great recruiters and, and Aranda's one of them, they know there's other ways to to gauge interest. There's other ways to figure out where you might stand or to to communicate said interest. Right. There are no rules against um, high school coaches, parents, uh, mentors, seven on seven coaches. There are no trainers. There are no rules prohibiting contact with those individuals so yeah. you could find out where you stand and vice versa a kid can maybe find out where he stands hey you know you know tell him to tell him to tell him to tell her to tell him i'd like to see if baylor's one of the schools that would, would keep an eye on me once i actually hit the portal it, it's it's a part of this process right it, it's like one of, it's like in recruiting right most kids who decommit from that high school scholarship they kind of already have the next move in mind, right? So it, it, it goes that way to a degree in the portal. It didn't happen like that at the very beginning. Everyone was jumping into the portal, and there were a lot of kids or, or young uh, men in that portal purgatory, right, where they yeah. they never got out, right, or they had to transfer down a division, and it got really hectic because there was a lack of information. But now we're to the point where most of these prospects – 
at least know of some type of destination once they make that move. But in terms of the coaches and the contact and all that, it's a lot more cut and dry in terms of when they can, but there's always ways around that as well. Again, very typical of any type of recruiting. Yeah. So obviously Seth Jones has entered the portal as of this week. And again, quote unquote, entered the portal, at least expressed that he's <laughs> he going announced to announced right. Right. At the end of this season, uh, which is another thing that again, it's just so wild to me. It's like, I can't do this yet, but I'm going to eventually. Um, and, and that's a fun wrinkle you add into this. And like you said, Wisconsin to Florida, to Auburn, Colorado. And I saw Houston too, all across the country, whether yeah. stable staffs or, or coaches that have been fired, these guys are making these announcements. If you're Baylor, who do you pinpoint as as guys that so far have been kind of the bigger names to enter the portal that a Baylor or or any really organization should go after? Well, I think Logan Brown's going to get a ton of interest, right? This was a former blue chip All-American offensive lineman, went to Wisconsin, took him a little bit of time to get going, uh, but he ended up you know, starting a few games, I, I think last year, uh, really got into that rotation and, and showed some product and production to back up that lofty ranking everybody needs tackle types he has that mold and obviously is looking for a fresh start and we would assume not a pro style conservative offense yeah. uh in that pursuit um but i think for for schools like baylor you look at skill position prospects there's already a bunch of quarterbacks that have said they are going to look into this you know depending on how the the rest of this season goes for baylor you want to keep an eye on that quarterback market because it's it's always the one that moves the needle it's the one that affects you the most right i mean yeah. gary bohannon you know look look at what, what happened there out for the season now at usf just kind of a a, a, a total uh you know wrench in, in your plans when it comes mm -hmm. to the qb position and the portal you know i, I think the boise state kid brock Myers, an interesting uh option there deacon hill uh, another wisconsin player has hit the portal or again announced his intentions there um you know jack tuttle a, a big time recruit from a few years ago who's who's a team captain at indiana has yeah. done the same thing so there's going to be a lot of quarterbacks available in short order. Um, but I think for a school like Baylor, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, wide receiver, I, I feel like is a position where we could see um, maybe some influx there. You know, I, I think uh, Isaiah Garcia, Consonata from Nebraska had a huge opening season game in that uh, the game in Ireland against Northwestern to get 100 yards in that one. You know, he has since announced his intentions to hit the portal. So, you know, guys like that, I think with production at those positions would make a lot of sense. Typically, the Baylor's pretty stout in the trenches. Uh, you expect them to address it through recruiting more so than the portal. But even a Dave Aranda who hasn't gone all in on the portal, to say the least, compared to, you know, Elaine Kiffin, Lincoln Riley, uh, Mel Tucker, uh, for example, I think even he will start to open it up a little bit more just uh, from an optics standpoint going forward. So the portal is always going to be a part of, uh, of the recruiting process and finishing your class. Maybe it's only a couple guys and you're just filling a, a few holes at a time, but there's inevitably a lot of talent and it's not always yeah. on the negative side, right? It's not always the guys who are like, Oh, I don't like my situation. I'm not playing. I want to go find a, a, a team I can actually play for last year taught us starters, uh, all conference, all American players uh, hit the portal as well. Just looking for more exposure or a better fit relative uh, to their coaching staff. There's a lot of reasons to hit the portal. So, yeah, I think um, a program like Baylor is going to be a little bit more active this time around. Yeah, John, before we get into how an in-season success or lack thereof can affect a spring recruiting class, I, I do want to ask, is this is this the the idea of players being able to, to come public about their intent in, in the transfer portal inherently good or inherently bad for college football. And I know that that varies between program and, and really across the world. I'm just thinking about how a guy like Seth Jones is probably still going to class on Tuesday, you know, oh, yeah. and, and has class with other players and just the things like that. Those aspects of this really blow my mind. Yeah, that that's the part that that is really hard to wrap your head around. Right. You know, we, we've even heard some of these announcements where they say, yeah, I intend to stay in school before mm -hmm. entering the portal in December or in January. So yeah, it is a different deal in that regard. I think in the off season, it's so much easier to understand when these announcements go out. Okay. Well, it's the off season, right? So you just enroll at your new school transfer credits, all that fun stuff. When it's during the season and during the school year, it's really hard to, to wrap your head around, but that's the play. Um, and I think it's going to, 
it's going to be weird optically for a while because yeah. you know there's going to be a, a player or two who says it and withdraws it. So he's going to, you know, decommit and then recommit to his own team that he's already, you know, signed right. up to play for at some point, you know. So I do think that will be interesting how the coaches then handle a situation like that, of course, will then be put under a microscope. And look, some of these – that's where we we learned about it, right? Like Dakari Collins, the Clemson receiver, big physical Peach State uh, Atlanta kid from a few years ago. Dabble Sweeney's the one who told, hey, uh, yeah, he has an intention uh, to to transfer after next year, so now he's no longer a part of the team. So yeah. it, it, the information comes in a variety of ways uh, in that regard. But yeah, like is Dakari still taking classes at Clemson? I think so. I don't know. So, but yeah, yeah that's that's got to create a different layer of you would hope maturity. For these players going through it, but inevitably there's going to be some, you know, frustration and, and perhaps some backtracking. Mm. Well, John, getting into how these teams are are either helping themselves or hurting themselves in recruiting with their performance this current season is something that I, I want to hit on. But first, I'll tell the folks at home about one of our newest sponsors here at Locked On and one of my new favorite ads too. Uh, I I have like this this thing, especially like podcasting or in radio or TV always, where I sweat. Like I, I seldom wear gray or I typically wear like crew necks or stuff because I will sweat through my shirt. Um, I think my most embarrassing sweat story was meeting Steve Levy of Monday Night Football and was like, oh, you know, Steve, like this is my freshman year too. So I didn't feel as bad getting a picture with him because you can do that as a freshman. It's like, oh, like, St I think I called him Steve. Maybe it's Mr. Levy. Like, let's get a picture together. And I have just like sweated up. Like my one picture with Monday Night Football Steve Levy is just, I got pit stains both sides that drip all the way down to my waist. Um, luckily though, there's a product for this sweat block. So I was able to fix my sweat problem. As you can see, see gray, no sweat with sweat block uh, gives you the confidence to wear what you want when you want. If you're someone you love is experiencing embarrassing sweat or even odor, sweat block is the place to go. You get 20% off with the promo code locked on at sweatblock.com. They're also available on Amazon. Again, that is sweat block. John, man, no easy transition out of that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I have the flu too. So I'm just, we're fighting some demons. Today. I was going to say, you're going to sweat a little more anyway, huh? Please. Um, the, the it's shocking to me. These are things that I was noticing in recruiting on Twitter this week is one guys going on the transfer portal, declaring that mid season. And the other is these recruits in 2023 that are decommitting from teams. It seemingly has this pattern of teams that are underachieving or teams that are three and three when they had better expectations. And Baylor is one of those squads right now, uh, seeing a lot of uh, a couple of Texas recruits that are doing that as well, which seems to be a trend just for their program in general now. Do you see a, a pattern of these these recruits doing so because of a lack of success with a team in the current season? Or do these decisions usually go a lot deeper than that? They're usually a, a bit deeper, um, but there's always a nudge or two, right? When, when the on-field product is congruent with your developing feelings, I, I, I would put, for yeah. some of these programs. Look, Michigan State uh, underachieving a couple decommitments in the last uh, few weeks, you know, and we see it, of course, on the expected side, right? When these coaching changes happen, naturally, those schools are, are going to deal with decommitments. Nebraska, Wisconsin, they, they've already gone, gone through that process. And then those that are seemingly unstable, like Auburn, yeah. We're, we're going to start seeing some decommitments there. They've already lost an in-state wide receiver in Carmelo English. So those are somewhat expected. But, yeah, I do think the trend of the season is is going to influence these kids a little bit more. It's never it's never a one-to-one -one ratio, right? It's never like, if you lose this game, I'm decommitting. Like, it's never right. that simple on the negative side. It really has more to do with perception, right? If there's chatter about your head coach, you will absolutely see some traction on the commit decommit front or if it's so under expectation and almost shocking i do think you could see uh some movement there so i think you know i think michigan state is a good example right um it, it, the sky's not falling in east lansing but pretty surprising slow start uh, in that regard so I, I do think you could expect uh, some more touch and go options with their commitments and remember it's not just the kids making these decisions, right? Other schools are picking yeah. up the phone and saying, hey, 
your school is not what you thought it was, right? So why don't you look at us? Things are stable. Things are good. We've only lost one game. Whatever conference we're in, we're in position mm-hmm. to, to make the title game, blah, blah, blah. Come check us out one more time. So I do think the the this time of year is when we start to see the frequency of kids committed to school A start to visit school B, C, and maybe even D to take a bit of a closer look. Uh, so I do think all those things do work uh, in, in unison with one another. So it's never just, oh, man. Baylor lost, so now I'm going to decommit. So Tori in York, you know, who's who's getting pursued by Old Miss and these other these other schools. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm going to decommit now because Baylor's three and three. It's never that simple. Um, oftentimes it is it is much deeper than that. There have already been other visits. There's already communication with other schools, and opening the process up starts to make more sense. And and the perception is just nudged by the current record, but it's never quite that simple. I mean. You know, I don't think Colorado, I haven't checked. Colorado's like barely lost any commits and they huh. they were winless and fired the coach. So it is yeah, it is very much not a a simple and easy to see process. It's never as as crazy as you expect it, even when there's an entire overhaul. Uh, so I do think um, we're just going to see a little bit more of that as as the season wears on. But a lot of times it's just because of visits and other schools getting invested. You know, it makes me think like Mel Tucker. Dana Holgerson, Dave Aranda, who are within their their second or third year at a school and high expectations that are not being met for this season. Uh, those three come to mind come to mind first right now. And how then you react recruiting? And I know they're all three very different head coaches with very different styles. But have you seen kind of as a trend coaches get a, a little more, mm, at least on watch when they when you feel like you're not meeting expectations do you get a, a, a bit more dramatic when you're in recruiting and trying to keep these guys on board yeah i think you see some doubling down from from those coaching staffs you know they realize that every element of the perception around their program is is a little more in question now than maybe 12 months ago and that's something that you should be aware of right there, there has to be a self-awareness in the recruiting process uh if you're baylor and you're looking to go get the number one player in Northern California who wants to play in an air raid off. I mean, it's probably not going to happen. Right. So right. you've got to be self-aware at a, a lot of levels uh, in the recruiting process. And yeah, I do think if that perception starts to slide or change for the negative, yeah, you've, you've probably got to double down, check in with your verbal commitments, maybe a little bit more, make sure they're still on board. And then with those targets that are out there, reiterate, Hey, this is just a bump in the road. This is not what yeah. we are becoming um so i I think there is a little bit uh, to say to that especially on the negative side yeah early in that tenure you do want to sort of secure things if if it starts to look like um there's there's a bit of uh water in the boat if you will yeah well my favorite segment of any week that john garcia jr is on the show is just the john's thoughts segment which started one week as a joke because i didn't have a third segment but now has become like one of my favorite things in the world before we get to that though i've got a quick buffer where i tell everybody at home about linkedin talent solutions uh if you are the athletic department at wisconsin or colorado or even auburn at this point linkedin talent solutions is the place to go when you need to find new employees because new head coaches are on the horizon for those programs. Uh, LinkedIn Jobs is the number one rated number one rated by small business for finding employees uh, and hiring people faster as well. So add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to LinkedIn profile. A super simple tool, screening question, make it easy to focus on candidates, funnel guys down. Uh, it's why small businesses, again, rated number one. So LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you need faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com. If you go to Locked On College, LinkedIn.com slash Locked on college that is where you will be able to post that job uh and find who you need to find faster linkedin.com slash locked on college post your job for free keep in mind what those terms and conditions do apply john how about those volunteers knocking yeah. off alabama this week uh any shock there for you um in in terms of the game flow yes uh i didn't expect tennessee to take such a commanding lead early and once bama came back I thought Tennessee would be buried. I thought yeah. that was going to be it. When when that the mesh point fumble happened, Bama takes it back to go up seven. I thought that was it. I didn't selfishly. I didn't want the game to end that way because it felt cheap. It felt like oh, yeah. this is fluky, right? You don't want it to end this way. Um, but you just you know, at one point, I thought Bama was going to win by double digits, right? When they started to catch up and just start to click, I think they scored what eighteen unanswered at one point. I thought 
okay, this is this is going to be you know kind of a wash in the end. But Tennessee showed some grit. Uh, I know they were at home and they've got this great offense that that helps out. And gosh, Bama just could not reroute Jalen Hyatt. I don't know why you allow the fastest player on the field a free release for all yeah. five of his touchdowns, but that's what Alabama elected to do, and, and they certainly paid the price for it. Now, now Jalen Hyatt's like uh, creeping up NFL draft boards, and he's yeah. all of a sudden becoming – you have a big game against Bama, and you can do anything. So um, he's now the the it wide receiver. Shout out to him. But, yeah, I thought – I thought the game was over at one point, and, and Tennessee's grit really captivated me. I thought that Hendon Hooker showed a ton of toughness and resiliency, obviously accuracy, boldness. Um, I thought he upped his stock as much as any prospect in one game, gosh, in, in, in the last year plus maybe. I mean, he just really, uh, I thought, captivated that entire uh, you know audience, uh, both on TV, which was a huge number, as well as the 100,000 plus in the stands. Um, so that's pretty cool for a guy who didn't win that job last year against Joe Milton, right? He yeah. was the number two quarterback. Milton gets hurt. And that's how we got Hendon Hooker starting at Tennessee. He, he didn't beat out Joe Milton on the front end. So incredible story there. But yeah, I think Tennessee's riding high as, as they should. Um, and they control their own destiny, right? Imagine if they beat Georgia in a few weeks. I mean, this becomes the the Cinderella of of the entire year and and the fact that they're even a cinderella candidate is crazy because yeah. when i was growing up tennessee was viewed as as we view tennessee or as we view alabama and georgia and ohio state and these other schools coming off of you know 10 win seasons back to back to back to back peyton manning heisman and the national title the year after he leaves just a great blue blood no-brainer program well in the last 15 years, it hasn't been that. So for the fact that they can even be a Cinderella yeah. is kind of the beauty of college football, right? Um, and, and I think that story is is one that I'm obviously more uh, keyed in on at this point. But yeah, they, they played the game of their lives, particularly on offense. Uh, so happy for that fan base because 15 years, that's a long time. Even even if you're a spoiled fan base, that's a long yeah. time to wait something out. So yeah, this, this was an unbelievable game. Uh, look, Bama's going to be okay. They try, they control their own destiny on, on their own um, side of the coin there uh, in the West. Uh, so I think it's one of those where everybody wins in the end. And, and, you know, Bama always has that game. That's like the wake up call game. Like yep. after they lost to AM last year, they were like, okay. And they started destroying everyone, even Georgia in the SEC title game. So I think Bama's about to do that once more uh, and double down and, and kind of roll everybody. Uh, so they're going to be you know involved uh, one more time. But if Tennessee can upset Georgia, a potential rematch rematch between those quarterbacks in a dome in December yeah. with, with a playoff berth on the line. I mean, sign me up for that. No disrespect to Georgia. I know you guys are going to hit my mentions now saying, well, what about us? But if they can pull that off and this rematch happens, I, I think that'd be must-see television to the highest order. But, yeah, uh, shout-out to the Vols. They earned it uh, multiple times. It felt like they had to win that game twice. They did, even though it was the ugliest game winner in the history of football, but they'll take it. The knuckleball kick was something spectacular. It almost added to the luster of the moment. Um, yes. They remind me a lot of 2013 Auburn, just kind of that luck factor where you march oh, to the yeah. national championship and most people are going, how, why? And it doesn't make a ton of sense, but it's just kind of happening in front of you. Uh, someone made the L 19, 2019 LSU comparison, which I, I'm not buying into that. That no. LSU team was just that dominant. Was across yeah. the board um but 2013 auburn i feel like also we're saying cinderella which i think absolutely applies because of the lack of parity in college football any team that's not alabama ohio state clemson georgia at this point is like a it's like a cinderella of sorts yeah, which is yeah amazing amazing because tennessee when i was like you couldn't you couldn't even that would be an insult to them right, right? right. you know 10 15 years ago so yeah amazing the the ebb and flow of of college football where these programs just they have their runs and then they, it goes away and then they can come back I have not mentioned on this show yet, and I, di I didn't know how to. I'm going to segue in now. My sister's dating Jeff Grimes' son. So okay. just a, a really wild piece together there. We had a show a couple weeks ago where it was Will B like Baylor. Jeff Grimes had like all these keyboard warriors wanting to fire him. So we did a show. I recused myself from that because of the personal ties. Um, but I will say that I got to kind of see him in action watching games on Saturday since Baylor was, was off on Saturday. And it's like, he's got iPad TV computer, like there's games everywhere. What is the sad, especially cause you, 
have now a baby in the household. What's yes. the Saturday of in the Garcia house? Like uh, that Bama game. Are you watching that with three other TVs going? Yeah. So on Saturdays, I've got a couple TVs on, um, on these tripods with wheels. So I wheel them into the living room, got the big boy and then the little ones and then the iPad. And then if I want to get really crazy, I have a couple laptops as well. So yeah, it, it gets a little hectic in, in the Garcia household on Saturdays, but it's, that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. Question for you. And I don't know if you can answer yeah. this coach Grimes. Yeah. Is he watching that Auburn game a little closely or mm. are you not allowed to say, <laughs> Um, I'll say this, John, and I, I don't want to reveal all of my secrets. Um, but Grimes, a big family guy, big family man. And he has kind of made a pact with his family that anytime he's got sons who are near graduation, um, he's, he's willing to stick it out at locations until they graduate. Mm -hmm. So he's got a son who is a junior in high school this year who Baylor's actually looking at. And I think not, I can't say anything definite and neither has Jeff, but that's something that I think is a really big factor at play for keeping him out of the Auburn conversation. Scoop, um, scoop right which there, is, baby. Yeah, kind of wild. I had I've had a couple of Auburn sources reach out, and that's my. I mean, he's just a big family guy. Not to say that that's going to be the case because sure. uh, a lot can change, but definitely uh, a weird thing that I think a lot of coaches people don't usually mention the whole family aspect. They forget like coaches are people outside of what they do on a Saturday. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, that that's kind of the case for him. I just I think he's he's bound to be a head coach. At, he's pretty soon in college football. Um, but boy, howdy, there for a little bit. He wasn't helping his case the first couple of weeks of the season. <laughs> Um, is it, has that shocked you that Baylor is three and three right now? I just, I'm, I'm still yeah. having trouble comprehending it. Yeah. I thought, I thought the BYU game was kind of the swing game, right? If you, if you win that one, you, you probably look and feel a little bit more like Baylor of, of last year. But I also think yeah. it's look, this big 12, man, it is good. Jeez. It is really good. And it's, you know, it's like, you're not allowed to say that, but it's really darn good. Yeah. And there's so many different styles, right? You've got balanced programs like Baylor and TCU's going crazy on offense. Texas is kind of back, but not really. I guess only a few is there. There's a lot going on in, in the big 12. Kansas state, you know, Adrian Martinez hasn't thrown an interception in the big 12. Like what? Kansas, by the way, was ranked for a couple of weeks in there. Oh yeah. By, by the way, speaking of a, a real Cinderella at any Jeez. point in football, uh, since, uh, Gail Sayers was there, yeah. but yeah, this is, this is something that is, is not talked about enough. The big 12 is really freaking good. And that's not something we've been able to say from a depth standpoint in quite a while. It feels like. Yeah. When Oklahoma is like the eighth best team. I mean, right. Hello. If not worse, like they look, they look really bad. Now, Dylan Gabriel being back is huge for them. Yeah. It, the conference in general, I think there's so many good quarterbacks too, that that's what makes like JT Daniels is not a bad quarter. His numbers are solid too at West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the bottom teams in the conference. So every team's got a quarter being at Kansas has been really yeah, good. With Daniels out. I mean, yeah, like I, that in itself makes every big 12 team relatively competitive. At least a lot of parity in the conference. Uh, the conference championship teams will probably have two losses each uh, or, or, you know, at least one of those teams will, which is, I think, just fun for the league in general. It means that everybody else can fight with the playoffs. The Big 12 is kind of on his own island this year against one another, uh, waiting for the 12 team playoff format to get in and an opportunity to actually make it at least. Um <laughs> But John, before we get you out of here, thank you for singing the praises of the Big Twelve. By the way, now people won't do that. You're kind of you're you're on the edge oh, there. Come on, man. How could you right not now. this year? I mean, you're line up. Th those those are some of the best stories in the sport, right? Look at Sonny Dykes, first year coach there at, at TCU, undefeated. Oklahoma State's been unbelievable, even though Spencer Sanders is older than me. I mean, there's a lot of of great storylines going on in in the Big 12 that that the defending champion being 3 and 3 isn't even this jaw dropping surprise cuz you're like well pretty good conference pretty good right. group that that they're going up against yeah and Spencer Sanders older than you and just now learned how to not throw as many interceptions <laughs> you, yeah, said he just, you said he that. still does it he still does it especially <laughs> in crucial moments against TCU but uh John for the folks out there that want to see your coverage when it comes to recruiting or college football in general uh where can they go where can they find you yeah, si.com slash college, all our content uh, right there, even on the basketball front. And Twitter, of course, we'll be hanging out every Saturday, especially John Garcia underscore JR. Yeah, for the rest of us, tomorrow on Locked on Baylor, Pigskin Preacher joins the show. Thanks to him for hosting the show yesterday as I'm down and out with the flu. I'm back, baby. Can't keep can't keep the kid down. Uh, when we come back tomorrow, we'll break down all things Kansas. Baylor, Kansas, homecoming on Saturday, 11 a.m. Don't want to miss it. This has been Always Will Be. Thanks for making it your first listen every single day. Locked on 
Baylor.